The Boston Athenaeum makes every effort to offer a wide variety of programming. Those who are familiar with our schedule will know that we offer many lectures, authors, and many lectures on the English country house. But we are also very concerned about other issues and regional issues, issues related to this side of the pond and to that end. Recently, we have hosted a panel discussion on the Rose Kennedy Greenway. Um, we have done a talk on global warming. And next month, Anthony Flint of The Globe will be here to talk about urban sprawl. That is why we are pleased today to have Mark Drayson to talk about Metro, Metro Boston and its future. Mark Drayson is a lifelong resident of the Boston area and brings public policy, housing, and economic development experience to his position as executive director of the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. Mr. Drayson served two terms in the Massachusetts House of Representatives, representing neighborhoods in Boston and Brookline. He worked for eight years as president and CEO of the Massachusetts Association of Community Development Corporations, which is the trade association for 70 nonprofit community-based developers. His housing expertise also stems from his years as executive director of the Citizens Housing and Planning Association and as director of private housing at the Executive Office of Communities and Development. Let's welcome Mr. Drayson. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you so much, and thanks to the Athenaeum for inviting us to speak today uh, on the future of the greater Boston region. Uh, our project is called Metro Future, Making a Greater Boston Region, and it is an attempt to develop a comprehensive plan for the greater Boston region. Uh, I'm going to be speaking a little bit about each of the slides, and I would ask you to follow along as we go through the presentation. First of all, allow me to say a little bit about my agency, the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, MAPC. We are the regional planning agency for Greater Boston. We cover 101 communities, from Cape Ann in the north to the Metro West area, Framingham in the west, all the way down to Duxbury on the south shore. And we are, by statute, responsible for developing a comprehensive plan for the region from time to time, which means that we do it about once every 10 years. Our approach is to be comprehensive and regional. When we have done these plans in the past, they tended to be what I like to call planner's plans. The plan that we developed in the 1990s was called Metro Plan 2000, and it is a wonderful document. In many ways, it served to presage many of the smart growth ideas about development that are in common usage and understanding today. But there was a problem with the plan. We did most of the work at our desks in our offices. This time, we are trying to pursue a new approach. And we're using some of the experience that has been gained in other cities, like Chicago and San Francisco and Salt Lake City, where comprehensive regional plans have been developed with a great deal of public participation and buy-in from what are called plan builders, people such as yourselves who actually help to put the plan together and therefore, we hope, have some commitment to its actual implementation. It's a well-known notion that the best plans sit on wonderful shelves like these all around us and are not often used to actually change the situation on the ground. With Metro Future, we are trying to break out of that mold. The Metro Future project started with a series of visioning meetings, polls, surveys, which all together involved over 3,000 people to figure out their visions for the region. We asked them basically, how would you like the region to be the same or different by the year 2030, which is our time frame? Then in the next phase, we created a model of the region's major trends. We asked the question, if we keep doing everything the way we're doing it now, what will the region look like in 2010, 2020, and 2030? We call that scenario number one, current trends extended to 2030 and you're going to get a presentation about that scenario today. Shortly after these briefings where we present the scenario to people, and we've been doing this at dozens of forums like this one throughout the greater Boston region, beginning in June, we will start having a series of forums where we call people together and say, okay, enough talking from us. Let's all sit down together around individual tables and try to plot out alternative futures for the region. Did we like the current trend scenario? Did we dislike it? 
What did we dislike about it? What would we like to change in order to bring the future of the region more closely into tune with the visions that people enunciated at the beginning of the process? We will then go through a process of evaluating the alternatives, selecting a preferred scenario, and the preferred scenario may pick and choose from various alternative scenarios. And then the most important part of the project is to develop implementation steps to make that preferred scenario a reality. And we t when we talk about implementation strategies or implementation steps at MAPC, we don't just mean sort of a paragraph saying it would be good to do this. We actually mean pieces of legislation, bills to be filed in the legislature, model bylaws to be adopted by municipalities, recommended actions for private corporations, for nonprofit agencies, even for individual families, which, if they are all implemented together, will bring us down the road we seek to go. Now, one thing that people have often said to us in the course of this process is, oh, it's a long process. It takes a total of three years. It's supposed to be done in the spring of 2007. Can't you do something in the meantime to get a few things moving? And in fact, that is what we're doing. We have developed a series of short-term action steps on which we think there's general consensus. We'll be talking a little bit more about those as we go on later on in the presentation. We'll actually give you the opportunity today through the postcards that are included with your package to send a little postcard right to your legislators in the House and the Senate asking them to take action on a few critical issues like refunding the Brownfields Bill that helps us to rebuild housing and commercial establishments on contaminated sites. Let me tell you a little bit about our study area. MAPC covers 101 communities, but in reality, the region covers 164 communities, and that's what we're studying. Most of the data that we present to you today relates to 164 communities that go all the way from New Hampshire down to the Rhode Island border and west almost all the way to Worcester. This region contains 4.3 million people and 2.3 million jobs. It is well over half the Commonwealth of Massachusetts from a population and jobs perspective, and as we all know, it is a very diverse region. In order to understand a little better uh, the findings that we've, that we've made, we've divided the region into three different types of communities. The inner core and regional cities, which are sort of in that, that off lavender there. Uh, the maturing suburbs, which are generally along Route 128, they are in brown. And then the developing suburbs, which have a little more open space, and those are in green. What are the inner core and regional cities? Well, you see some of them named on the map before you. They tend to contain high-density neighborhoods. There are lots of multifamily housing units in these communities. This is where most of the immigrants, the international immigrants in the region, are located. There's a lot of old industrial land. So redeveloping on the brownfields that I mentioned a few moments ago is really critical in these communities. A few of the more regional cities, places maybe like Milford or Norwood is there. It's not named, but it's there have a fair amount of land still available for development, but for the most part, these communities are largely built out. The maturing suburbs along Route 128 and then along the South Shore are more moderate in their density. They do tend to be mostly single-family homes, but you can find plenty of multifamily units here. They don't have as much open land available for development as you might commonly think. And then there are the developing suburbs. These areas have plenty of vacant land available for development. Some of them have been growing very rapidly. Communities like Franklin grew more than 40% during the 1990s. A few of them are built up, but many of them continue to have rural areas and even some farms. Well, how many of you read the front page of the Globe today? Okay, well, that's an indication of the strength of the print media. In any event, um, <laughs> Had you read it, you would have seen another in a series of articles about the declining population in the greater Boston area and in Massachusetts. Uh, the Census Bureau has come up with a number of, of, of studies uh, that point to this decline. We actually tend to take a somewhat different view of the situation. We don't believe from our research that the population of Massachusetts or of the greater Boston region is actually in decline. It is true that many people move out of Massachusetts and move out of this region. That is a cause for concern. 
But typically in recent years, that is more than made up for by international immigration, which is very high here compared to some parts of America. That being said, we still expect that between now and 2030, the growth rate in this region will be slow compared to the region as a whole. We expect it to grow by about 11 percent compared to 28 percent for the nation as a whole. Migration is a very important factor here. The people moving out of the area tend to be over 30, and about half of them are college educated. So losing them is a real concern. But international immigrants do make up for the loss. Most of them are coming from Latin America and from Asia. And about a third of them have bachelor's degrees and have a fair degree of employable skills. Others, however, have very limited skills in English, lack a high school diploma, and need training in order to fit into the region's economy. Let me just say a little bit more about immigration in the region, because it's a topic of great interest, obviously. You can't turn on the news these days without hearing about the immigration question. Where do the immigrants in the region live? About a quarter of them are in the city of Boston and another quarter in seven other communities. It is a fact that recent immigrants tend to settle in urban areas. And even if you look at a map that shows that immigrants, people who were born in a foreign country, have dispersed to some degree to the suburban communities, that tends to happen after they've been in the country 10 years. Now, usually, this is one of the slides that attracts the most people's attention. As we move toward 2030, we expect to see a major change in the age demography of the region. We anticipate real drops in the number of people under 19 and the number of adults between 20 and 54, and a 75 percent increase in the number of people over 55. America is aging, and this region tends to be aging faster than the rest of the country. People tend to have general knowledge of this. They know about the baby boomers, and they know the baby boomers are moving toward their retirement years, and they're not surprised to hear that there's some aging of the population. Most people don't realize how dramatic it's likely to be. And sometimes people say to me, well, but you know, these baby boomers might not stay here. They might move to other parts of the country. Uh, they might get a second home. And my response to that is, of course, these numbers, like any of the numbers in our projections, are only the best estimate of what might happen, and they're based on past trends. Future people may act differently. But the change is not likely to be, the change from what you see here, the difference from what you see here, is not likely to be dramatic because of something that I like to refer to as the iron rule of the age cohorts. It's true that in the future, senior citizens may move a little more, they may go to other places, they may, you know, the birth rate, the death rates may be a little different than they've been in the past, higher or lower. But for the most part, folks, if someone is aged between 30 and 40 today, add 10 years and they will be aged between 40 and 50. <laughs> and, you know, there's very little, there's very little that we can do about that. Uh, people say that baby boomers are likely to move to warmer climes more than their predecessors did. But it's not clear that they will have the financial wherewithal to do that. Also, people are living even longer than they used to. And there's a reverse migration impact that we're beginning to see. People move to Florida or Arizona perhaps when they're 65 or 70 or 75, but when they're 80 or 85 or 90, they move back to be closer to their children. So while we might quibble over the exact amount of the increase, the fact of the matter is that this area is aging and it's aging dramatically. And that's going to have a tremendous impact on issues like health care and transit and public safety and all kinds of public policy issues which, frankly, it would be better to try and deal with now rather than waiting until the change is upon us. Sometimes we like to talk about what we call our regional street. Now, this is downtown crossing, and, you know, it's one of the few places where you can actually see sort of a reflection of the region as a whole. And we ask people to think about what the changes are going to be on our regional street, a typical uh, 100 people, between now and the year 2030. In the year 2000, 82 percent of the people were white. We expect that to be 69 in 2030. Number of people of color will dramatically increase by almost half. The number of people born in a, in a foreign country already high are ex, is expected to also increase by about half. And, you know, there's been some slowdown in that since September 11th, but much less than people commonly believe. 
The number of people aged under 20 years will decline slightly, while the number of people aged over 55 will increase dramatically. Now, of course, everybody knows that the regional street is a mathematical concept. It's not actually something that you can find in most places of the region, because this is a region where our diversity is very different from place to place. We have very diverse areas. We have areas that are not diverse at all, that are very homogenous. And there is lingering segregation throughout the region. About 18% of the region consists of people of color. But 75% of them are concentrated in only 14 of those 164 communities. There are 85 towns in this region. It's about half the communities that are over 95% white. We didn't feel that we had enough good data to actually project how those patterns of segregation might change, but we thought it would be interesting to see what happened during the 1990s just to get a sense about that issue. The share of the non-white population during that period of time, the percentage of people of color, increased by 5%. But it was driven very largely by an increase in the population of color in urban areas. The non-white population was growing extremely slowly in 134 communities. In fact, in the year 2000, the region was more heavily segregated than it was in 1990. And if current trends persist, there is no particularly good reason to expect that that will change dramatically in the region as a whole. It may change in two or three or six communities, but in the region as a whole, we anticipate our segregation will likely be worse. Now let's uh, talk a little bit about each of these three sectors. If you remember before, we talked about the inner core and regional cities, the maturing suburbs, and then the developing suburbs. Let's uh, focus in and look a little more closely at each one of them. In the inner core and regional cities, we expect there'll be about 35%, about a third of the region's total growth in, growth in population, driven largely, not exclusively, but largely by international immigration. They will need 120,000 additional housing units to house that population. We anticipate, looking at current growth patterns and zoning, that about two-thirds of those will be in multifamily units. And here's the really interesting point, I think. About 90% of those units will be produced through what's called redevelopment. That means building up on an existing structure, uh, making a, taking a residential structure that perhaps includes only one unit right now and subdividing into three units, either apartments or condos, or building on commercial land that you're converting to residential. Nine out of ten new housing units in these inner core and regional cities will be created that way through redevelopment. It's one of the reasons we feel this Brownfields Fund is so critical, because if you're going to build on land like this, you generally have to clean it up. In the maturing suburbs, again, we expect it'll be around a third of the total growth. Again, these are the communities along 128, somewhat along Route 2 and down Route 3. They'll need about 100,000 new housing units, but they have a problem. Only about 15% of their land is vacant and available for development. Their zoning so precludes housing production that they cannot produce enough housing to meet that 100,000 goal under their current zoning. They would fall short by about 25,000 units. And the only thing that can happen under those circumstances is that either there's more development in the rest of the region or people move out of the region. So it's a tremendous public policy concern that we have that the zoning in these communities literally will not permit the development of the housing that their population increase is likely to demand. We move out to the developing suburbs. Again, about a third of the total increase. We see problems, but a different kind of problem. They need 86,000 new housing units. Under their current zoning and past trends, they're likely to do that almost exclusively as single-family homes. They could do it. There's enough land out there through one-acre subdivisions or more than one-acre subdivisions to build 86,000 units, but only at the cost of losing 85,000 acres of open space. In fact, throughout the region as a whole, we anticipate that we'll lose about 150,000 acres of open space. That is equivalent to the area between Salem and Quincy within Route 128. Think of what a huge area that is. That's the open space that we will lose unless we change our patterns of development in the next 25 years. So if you came back a year from now or two years from now, maybe it wouldn't look so different. But boy, if you moved away 
and you came back 25 years from now, the New England landscape that you see in this region, it would not be recognizable to you at that point in time. Now, there are ways of dealing with that. We can build these housing units in denser patterns of development. There are ways to do that. Some of those ways are being demonstrated by certain developers in this region and by many developers in other parts of the country. We don't have to stick with the very open form of development with very large lots. But right now, that's not what we're doing. Well, all these people need a place to live. They also need a place to work. And fundamentally, we're expecting about the same thing from a jobs perspective. Growth, but slow growth. Slower than the nation as a whole. Unlike the housing production, we anticipate that job creation will be heavily concentrated in four key areas. North of Boston, in Metro West, south of Boston, which is usually surprising to people, in the Westwoods and Dedhams and Weymouths and Quincy's of the world, and also in the city of Boston. The city of Boston and the immediately surrounding urban communities like Chelsea and Cambridge and Somerville are growing. They've turned around. They're no longer losing jobs. We expect them to be gaining jobs. We expect them to be a growth center, one of the four major ones. People always ask me about the, the one on the bottom there, and that's, that's the town of Plymouth, which shows up because it's big. We expect about 3,000 uh, new jobs there. That's not actually one of the really huge growth centers, but it is growing. What kind of jobs will they be? Well, it'll come as no surprise to people that a lot of these jobs will be in our big sectors, in education and healthcare, as well as in the services industries. Transportation, trade, and utilities will also see some growth, as will leisure and hospitality. That's where the tourist industry is. We expect to continue to see manufacturing losses not necessarily worse here than in other parts of the country. It's a nationwide trend, as you know. People often ask about the high-tech industry. The high-tech industry cuts across many of those sectors that you saw on the previous slide. We expect it to grow, but more slowly here than in other parts of the country, which, of course, is a big concern for us because right now our economy is heavily dependent on and very focused on high-tech jobs. Now, if the, the slide about age gets the people's most attention, I think this is the most important slide in the presentation. It is a slide that describes the mismatch that is likely to exist between the jobs that will be here in 25 years and the skills of the prospective employees. Now, let's take a look at the red bars. Actually, they're orange there. And the orange bars tell a story that you hear about very frequently which is that people with advanced degrees are moving out of the region, and as a result, there is a shortage of workers in that area. And there are many public policy steps that are recommended to try and deal with that issue and keep those people with graduate degrees or college degrees from moving out of the region. And all of those are good objectives and good policies. But we don't pay enough attention to the blue bar at the left. We anticipate that there will be a roughly 75,000 person mismatch or surplus of workers for people with less than a high school degree. This means that those folks won't be able to find employment in the region, that wages will continue to be low in those jobs, that it will be difficult for those folks to get onto the home ownership ladder or the employment ladder. Now the news here is not all bad. Because if we could actually invest in training of those individuals and we can move them up to an associate's degree or a bachelor's degree, there would actually be jobs in the region available for them. So one of the things we're asking is that we pay as much attention to the blue bar as we do to the orange bars as we develop our new scenarios and our policies going forward. I'm going to speak a little bit about education in the region, really only just one corner of the education picture. People often say that the number of students in the region is increasing, and in many communities that's been true. But it is not likely to be a long-term trend. We're likely to peak in 2010, and after that point in time, we're likely to see declines in the school-age population in most, not all, but most communities. About 10 school systems, mainly out in the developing suburbs along I-495, are likely to see an increase of over 10%, but those will be the exceptions rather than the rules. 
And of course, we know that urban school systems, particularly with large populations of children that have severe English deficiencies, will continue to face dramatic challenges in the years ahead. Education is mostly, not entirely, but mostly paid for by cities and towns. So people often ask what's likely to happen to the finances of those cities and towns. And frankly, the future does not look all that bright. Of course, we all know we're very dependent on the property tax here. Without a change, either in Prop 2 and a half or allowing communities to raise revenue from sources other than the property tax, we are likely to see continued dependence on the property tax, up to 62% of municipal revenue from a current 54. People know that there has been a lot of increase in state aid, not in the last couple of years, but if you look in the longer term, like over the last 12 or 14 years, there has been dramatic increase in state aid. But much of that has gone to education, a good public policy. But there's actually been a decline in the amount of money available for all the other things that municipalities do. Police, fire, libraries, caring for senior citizens, fixing the roads. Money available for all of those activities has actually declined in terms of state aid. So while you absorb this slide, I'll take a sip of water. How many people here live or know they live in the MWRA district? Okay, that basically means you get your water from the Quabbin Reservoir and you've got nothing to worry about. Now you may have something to worry about in 20, 30, or 40 years, but right now there's plenty of water. And so in your lives, you don't think about water very much. Your bills might be a little higher than they were five or 10 years ago, but if you pay your bills, you get your water, there's no problem. But if you live in the 104 communities that have local water systems, or if you live in the 22 communities where everyone is on private wells, you do have issues. And you probably spend a lot more time thinking about water than if you're in an MWRA community. Right now, 22 local water systems, it's the same number as a, another number on the previous slide, but that's a coincidence. 22 of the 104 local water systems exceed what are called the state withdrawal limits. The state tells those communities how much water they can withdraw every year. And right now, 22 of these communities are already exceeding the limit. The Department of Environmental Protection has tried to enforce that limit and is trying to change the behavior of some of those communities so they can conserve and use less water. Those communities, what have they done? Of course, they've sued assuming, I presume, that a judge can make it rain more. Now, that's not likely. The, the item might be settled in court. DEP and the municipalities may figure out some kind of an accommodation or compromise. But in the long term, we have problems that can't be solved judicially. We expect that by 2010, the number of communities exceeding their water limit will increase. And further, by 2020, until in 2030, approximately 50 of these communities will exceed their Water Management Act limit. And the scary point is that 40 of them will exceed it by over 100,000 gallons a day. Now, I know that doesn't have a lot of meaning for you, but it's a lot of water. It doesn't mean you're in technical violation. It means you're really drawing down the aquifer. You're really drawing down the local reservoir. It's not a sustainable situation over the long term and there are dramatic impacts on quality of water and quality of habitat and quality of open space and recreational facilities throughout the region. Now, this doesn't have to be entirely a negative thing. The reason is because if we anticipate this problem, there are steps that we can start taking today to deal with this issue. We can encourage low-impact development where we build things that we need but they use less water than they do under present development standards. We can start reusing water, not necessarily for drinking, but for lots of other activities where you can use water that has been slightly used already. We can try and recharge a certain amount of water into the rivers and streams and aquifers so that we build their levels up. So it's not like the Ipswich River to the north, which in the summer is entirely effluent at the moment. No natural water at all during summer months. But it would be better and easier to take, the, take these steps today than to wait until 2020 or 2030 when those steps will not be able to resolve the problem in time.
The last topic we're going to talk about today is everybody's favorite thing to hate, of course, and that's traffic in the region. And what do you know? We expect the traffic congestion may get worse. You know, that's a tremendous surprise to all of you. The map in front of you maps traffic congestion in 2000. It's basically a comparison of what we call vehicles to capacity. How many vehicles are on the road compared to how many vehicles the road was built to bear. And you can see that the darker the area, the more the traffic congestion. Nothing particularly surprising in this map. In 2030, however, it's going to get worse. There are going to be more vehicles. They are going to be driving more miles. We expect gasoline consumption to increase by about 20 percent, regardless of the, the increase that may occur in price. If prices continue to increase as they have been recently, we expect that the, the gasoline used will be a 20 percent increase over what it is today. Naturally, there's some elasticity there at some point. If the prices go up dramatically higher, people may be forced to do other things. Let's toggle back and forth between these two just so you can get a sense of how much more yellow this map is and how much more red or orange this map is. Now, one thing that's good to note is that our access to transit is likely expected to increase. The number of jobs and houses within a half a mile of a bus stop, a subway stop, or a commuter rail station is likely to increase from 25% of the region to 30% of the region. And already, these numbers here are pretty high compared to most other parts of the country. The question is whether or not we will invest in the system adequately, both its maintenance and its expansion, to actually capture that new market and keep those people off the road. So what is likely to happen with transit ridership? You can see in the year 2000, this map displays the share of rides that were in transit. You can see that for the most part, the serious use of transit is really very heavily limited to the urban core. We expect to see that change a little bit. Transit ridership as a whole is likely to increase by about 16 percent. It won't be on the entire system, though. The blue line and express buses are likely to see the greatest increase commuter rail and local bus ridership may decline unless we do something to intensify their use. Well, I'd like to close by reminding you that this is a projection and not a destiny. Very often I, like, I look at people in the crowd as we're talking through these projections and boy, they look sad. It just doesn't look like a very happy picture. You know, you folks decided to come in from a beautiful day. It's 70 degrees. You could have had lunch on the common. You came in here to listen to this. And it's depressing. The reason it shouldn't be depressing is because we are projecting it today in April of 2006, and we have the time to develop alternatives, to create implementation steps, to create consensus around the steps we need to take and to make changes that will make 2030 the kind of year we'd like to live in and that we'd like our children to live in. We can do this if we recognize the difficulties that we're likely to face. The projections that we gave to you may not come true exactly. There will be differences. There will be changes in activities and practices. There are, there are things we couldn't anticipate but they form the best, most realistic assessment of where we're going. And therefore, they're the most realistic basis for deciding what our public policy activities ought to be going forward. I'd like you to take a look. We'll have time for questions, but I'd like you to take a look at the packet in front of you. There's a very short form that we'd really like you to fill out. And the most important thing about that form is to commit to come to one of the forums that we are beginning to have in June. We're going to start them in June. And we're going to skip the summer and reconstitute them in September and October. Those will be the opportunities for you to come to an event where I talk less and you talk more, where we actually build the alternative scenarios for the regional plan. I'd also like you to take a look at the postcards that are in front of you. Please fill them out. They ask our legislators to take action on recapitalizing the state's Brownfields Fund and to take action on creating a more realistic system for disposing of surplus state land. If you don't know who your legislator is, 
don't fill it in. Just sign it. Give it to us with your address. We will send it to the right person. If you do, please put in your legislator's name. Hand it to one of the members of my very capable staff who are standing in the back of the room there. Why don't you raise your hand, folks, just so people can take a look at who you are. And we will make sure to deliver it to the State House. We'll probably do that right after this event. We'll just walk across the street and drop them off there. And so with that, I would like to again thank you and the Athenaeum to bring our presentation to a close, and I would be glad to answer your questions, or even better, to hear your comments about what we should be doing to make the future bright in the greater Boston region. Thank you. And I would ask you if you could please, when you stand up, identify yourself. Mr. Kargman, who needs no introduction. Bob, I think that's a good idea, and we'll take that under advisement for the forums and see if uh, in the planning that we're doing for the forums starting in June we can do something of that kind. Other questions or comments or ideas? Uh, yes, the gentleman in the back. Uh, my name Go. is Bob Dyninger. Okay. And, uh, I live in Westwood, Massachusetts. Yes. I'm interested whether the council is involved in you know, Westwood Station. Yeah. Being discussed the right. It, it's amazing that you asked that question. Uh, on my way in here, I, was, uh, I had my cell phone in my hand, and I was listening to my voicemail messages. And I got a voicemail message from one of the uh, attorneys representing the developers of Westwood Station asking for a meeting with us. It will actually be the second meeting. I can't say that we're actively engaged in the project, because MAPC is a wonderful organization uh, for uh, sort of raising issues and creating a forum and discussing issues. Sometimes we try to have a real influence over the individual projects, but honestly, most of the decisions are made by the town. I know that for every project of that size, we will be reviewing it, we will be commenting on it in detail, we will be recommend making recommendations to the municipality, to the developer, and also to MEPA, the Mass Environmental Protection Agency, which reviews it. And I do expect that uh, early in May we will have our second meeting with the town and the developer. Uh, there was another gentleman also in the back who had a question. Yes, sir. Yes. It's good to see you, sir. Uh, that's, that's right That's right on the mark. Um, it is true that, uh, you know, every regional planning agency that creates a regional plan grapples with that, with that fact. We are trying so hard to make people realize that as citizens, as long-term residents of this region, even if you spend 98% of your time working on short-term issues, you should spend 2% of your time working on the long-term. One of the best things that all of you can do is to encourage your friends and neighbors to come to the forums. We will have your email addresses, I hope. We will have your mailing addresses, and maybe even, if you're willing, your phone numbers, so that we can let you know when the forums are and keep you up to date on what's happening with the project. Bringing more people to the forums will help them to learn more about the ideas. It will also give us a broader array of opinions to help develop the plan. We are coming to about the end of what we call our briefing season, when we go out and make this presentation to groups. But there is still time to schedule more. If one of you feels that through, your organ through an organization, your work, your, your civic life, you have a group of folks that you think would really benefit from this presentation, then call us, 
and we will try and schedule something with you. Yes. Well, I think, it's, I think there are important ways that we have to try and make that change. One of the things, I think, is to always try and, and emphasize this issue of the job skills mismatch. Um, this is not an issue, honestly, that, get talk, that gets talked about all that much. Uh, there's a lot of hand-wringing right now about uh, whether or not the region is competitive economically. And as a person who's worked in the housing field for most of my adult life, I'm very pleased that the, this idea that housing has an impact on the economy is now an idea that's in good currency. It doesn't always change all the activities on the local level, but most people do seem to have a recognition of the fact that we have to have enough place to house our people at a reasonable price if we're going to be competitive economically. The same cannot yet be said of the link between adult education, skills retooling, investing in our community and vocational colleges and the strength of our economy. Part of the educational process that we're trying to go through with this briefing and that we hope you will carry forward to other venues is to make that link and get people to recognize that this is really an investment in our economic strength. Mark, yes. Well, we developed a fairly complex model, actually, uh, using the software community viz to help to create uh, the data that you see in front of you today. And one of the fun things that we're going to do at the forums is actually use the community viz software to go into the model and say, okay, if we were to change this, what would the outcomes be? And if we were to change that, what would the outcomes be? Of course, any time you build a model, you have to limit the number of things that you're looking at. Um, and global warming was not one of the things that we actually modeled. We do have more information on air quality that's part of our traffic analysis, which I simply didn't have time to present on the screen. But it is always possible in developing an alternative scenario for people to suggest that another issue like climate change can be taken into account. And because we've actually done some modest work, not a huge amount, but some staff work on climate change issues as part of climate change study efforts, uh, we would be glad to consider that in developing the alternatives. Now, why is it that only the guys have their hands up here? Yes, ma'am, please. Um, I was, um, Could I ask you to introduce yourself? Sorry. Yes, right. And ran into, was basically told it was against the uh, current plumbing and culture board. In what town? Uh, this was on Martha's Vineyard. Oh, okay. And is somebody, is somebody working on, like, you know, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's regulatory and actually yeah. plumbing regulations. Right. Well, of course, the water situation on the vineyard in Nantucket and on the Cape is a little unusual compared to the water situation elsewhere. Um, because of the very delicate environments, it's possible that the requirements and regulations there will legitimately be different than they are in other places. I can't claim to be an expert on that. There are three, three wonderful people on my staff who have tremendous technical expertise in the water field and are the director of that program on both water and air resources. Uh, his name is Martin Pillsbury. Martin and his staff have recently written a, a piece, uh, sort of a workbook, on water reuse. And it can be found on our website, which is www.mapc.org. Uh, they've recently done two pieces, one on low-impact development and the other on water reuse. 
and definitely as part of our implementation strategies for Metro Future, we want to make specific recommendations of bylaw changes in municipalities that will permit more water reuse. Whether or not that will be appropriate on the vineyard, I'm not sure, but in most parts of Massachusetts, it would be entirely compatible with uh, environmental sensitivities. Uh, yes, sir, toward the back. Uh, you raise an excellent question. You raise a question which is really a very deep one compared to the issues that we're talking about here because if we're going to have success in confronting these issues, whether it's water or housing or environmental quality or open space protection, any of those issues are going to require a balancing between local control and decision making and either regional or statewide control and decision making. Uh, let me say a little bit about MAPC. The council itself, the Metropolitan Area Planning Council consists of representatives of all 101 municipalities. The state agencies appoint a few people, the governor appoints a few people, but for the most part, my bosses are the representatives of the 101 municipal governments. And of course, they cherish and value local control. And local control and decision making has shaped this area and has done a lot of very good things. Where we seem to, and then of course, sorry, let me just say, on the other end of the spectrum, of course, are state mandates and state requirements. It always in Massachusetts seems to be one or the other. Either you have complete local control, which you protect almost as a, as a birthright, or the state comes in and slaps you down and says, too bad, this isn't working, we have one size fits all, do it. We never think about the in-between. One of the things that MAPC really promotes is what we call interlocal cooperation. It's individual municipalities sitting together, working together to assess their problems, to see if there are common solutions, and to respect each other in their work. It's very common for municipalities to have a development right on the border where the impacts go to the other town. If only they would try and work with that other town in planning the development, maybe that other town would consult with them the next time that they have an issue to raise. Creating structures of regional cooperation is a key to being able to tackle these problems. They can't be tackled by state mandates alone, and they can't be tackled by unfettered local control. I think we have time for perhaps one more question. Yes, miss. Well, maybe we should. I, I actually didn't tell you all this, the short-term action steps. I only chose to mention two today. But we do have five, and the tax credit is not one. We are always interested in adding short-term action steps. Uh, it usually has to be an item that has broad consensus behind it. 
I am actually appearing before a preservation audience in um, early May, and it's not for one of these briefings. It's to discuss public policy issues that we can work on together. I fully expect that the, tra the tax credit is going to be one of those topics. And after that, perhaps we will add it as a short-term action step if there seems to be general consensus. If there isn't, then we can certainly consider it for one of our alternative scenarios and implementation steps in the Metro Future Project. Do we have time, Susan, for more questions? For one more? Okay. Yes, sir. Well, MAPC is a smart growth organization. If you go to our website, www.mapc.org, you will find our smart growth principles. Uh, and the organization as a whole, through all of its work, whether it be low impact development or water reuse, working with towns on zoning bylaws, encouraging the development of affordable housing in appropriate locations, all of these activities are focused on smart growth. We tend to try and pursue it with a bit of a light touch because sometimes we find that people feel we are lecturing them about how they should live. Sometimes people say, well, you just want us to never use our car, and of course that isn't true. What we want you to do is use your car, but also every now and then use the bike, or every now and then use transit, or every now and then walk to, to a location. And we would like the land to be developed in such a way that you'd be able to actually have those choices. So our hope is, that as we develop the alternative scenarios, these smart growth issues will come to the fore. And uh, it's, it's certainly the hope of MAPC and of our executive committee that when we develop the actual scenarios, the alternative scenarios, and the implementation steps, that it will move us in this direction. We do have a unique life and a unique uh, geography here in New England and even in Greater Boston, even though this is the most heavily developed part of New England, there is something about it that says New England. That tourism industry, which we talked about a little earlier, that is supposedly growing, is heavily based upon the notion that people can come here and see something different. A gentleman from Manchester by the Sea indicated that one of the strengths of having all these different municipalities is not just that each one is separate and each one is pretty and each one is nice to go to, it's also that each one is unique. They're different from one another. If you ride between eight small towns or eight cities, four, four and four perhaps, in the course of a day, you see different places, and that in and of itself is a value. If we keep developing the way we are now, if we get to the 2030 that we've projected, this place will not look like that. It may not be anywhere USA, but it will be less easy to distinguish from other parts of the United States. And I guess what we're saying is that there are steps we can take and not really painful steps that will help to preserve that identity that we all cherish so much. Thank you very much.